something new every day. Apparently, there we go. Apparently, DrupalCon is capital D, capital C. Never done that before, but there were really, really explicit instructions in the email that went into that address that you're providing. Sorry for that cross phone there, everybody. Um, but yeah, DrupalCon, capital D. Take note, I'm not going to be there. And that includes me. That includes Twitter. Strictly that includes me. Uh, so, thank you everybody for uh, coming to the presentation on, on Dog and Git. I hope that was good. Well, I'm not saying anybody needs to be here, but the first and most important thing to say in this entire presentation is that you are, in fact, attending a vaporware event right now. You know, there's that usual licensing and stuff, but I could try to also play it off on the fact that, as will become pretty clear over the rest of the presentation, what Dog is trying to do in its development career and its enterprise is something that is going to be happening. Um, and the more that I've thought about this this kind of situation and this uh, this this thing that needs to be able to accommodate the more that it's going to really apparent to me that it is a very 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 flexible otherwise false concept. So I'm going to kind of play it off of that. I'm going to play it off of play on the fact that um, I, uh, I, I've been keeping track of things and that's fine. Uh, but basically we should assume that unless I say otherwise, that this is not the kind of thing that is going to be happening. Um, there is a, a trifecta of where things are all going, and it is my intention that as we work on this, what we should do is begin to work on the rest of the trifecta. However, it doesn't mean that's not going to happen. Also, um, sort of to that end, there is a boss on DOG tomorrow morning, 11 a.m., and 331 is set in the morning for everyone, unless you have some other reason. Uh, folks who are just, hmm? It's not what I meant. Oh, it's not what I meant. Thank you. I was like, you guys can't see me at all. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, it's like, so I expect them to cancel my session that day, but they're like, well, I don't know what you mean. Uh, so, yeah, so I mean, folks who are just curious about this and have general questions, obviously welcome. This is our boss. Go, go up. Um, I do have a hope, though, uh, that folks who might be interested in contributing to some segments will show up. I have got, you know, areas of dog that are fairly discreet that I think we could work on to begin to get comfortable with what this is. And it's a big, complicated project, so that's what we're doing. Um, so, tomorrow and again, we'll see you at that. places that it can go. And I'm going to talk about a bunch of those things in a moment, um, but I want to just start by giving you an idea of the scope of what this is and what it's going to be able to do. Um, so on the one hand, it is a build system for Drupal very much like Snake. Snake was built by Snake and is working there and is going to be very much like Snake. So it's not just Snake. So it's not just Snake. It's Snake. Dog is also a, a component that sets the sequence of deployment Update process is the first thing that it does. Um, sorry, the uh, phone number is not in the announcement that I made earlier, but I'll get to that now. Uh, as well as uh, the whole sequence of deployment and all that stuff. And most generally, it's just a simple capturing and managing of the whole thing and all of its features. Um, so that's a sort of wide picture, but um, at the end of the day, I, the thing that I'm hoping um, the experience dog will impart is. Instead of having to ask a bunch of these individual questions and sorting around and coming up with all kinds of details that don't need to be registered and instead of having to say, congratulations, all of your steps are capitalized in these files and that kind of fun stuff, Dog will roll that up into a simple command for you. Um, and you sort of are, are left with the feeling that everything makes perfect sense. All right, so uh, one note on capitalization. It's funny, I think that's something that we should get stuck on too. But um, this is a dog, but capital D, capital D, capital D. 
and to understand that I'm also a man, and I, I, I understand that the, the, the animals are perhaps not really as friendly and efficient as you or anything like that, and that this dog is just as capable of loving and having babies as I am, and I want to pay them to accept that as an input. For the purposes of, of what this dog has to do, I'm going to take the nerdy little hipster pooch over the big giant black and white dog any day. And for me, when I think of dog and all cats, it's one of the dog in the middle. So I'm kind of insistent about the location that you do this from Bond Cave, because that's my favorite place to do it. I like that place a lot. Um, uh, and yeah, also then kind of on this note, um, it was totally a named dog on purpose. Actually, it's the name of a cat, and you know, obviously when you name a dog, you have to make a lot more jokes about the dog and make a lot more clever things about it. So, uh, however, I, I would like to think the dog is maybe the only project on Google for very serious projects on Google where where you can submit a patch based on nothing but improving the tiny nature of the project, and I would accept that. There is even a component where you could do a little bad joke about the dog. All right, so presentations like this is just to start with big like overview just for what the problems are that we're trying to solve. Uh, I suck at that, but I'm going to try it anyway, and then after that I'm going to talk about some things that I like. Um, so uh, in actually managing a Google account, uh, there are sort of two, two pieces or two different woes that, that get to play here. You have, number one, that really deep strikes are not completely um, difficult to wrap up everything that actually goes into a Google site in what, you know, an individual started to see some of this. Uh, yeah, it, it's sort of prohibitively difficult to work across multiple instances because how do you wrap up a code and database and files and then whatever else that goes into something that actually looks like some sort of single thing that you can sort of wrap your brain around? And it can end up making it even difficult or even prohibitively difficult to to work across multiple instances. So there's sort of in instances when you've got things like Touch Hand or Touch Hand Developer or something that you've got open and you've got Competing integration tools that are sort of trying to work and move across all of these things, and you try to do something like that, and it's just sort of overflowing with stuff that needs to get done. Um, uh, but uh, we started to see a standard sort of emerge with with this. Um, we uh, we sent some best shot review out to the uh, Tarball project that um, you can uh, go to to get those documents and sort of see the uh, impact of things like Touch Hand, and that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So another problem is that code from Tarball is slow. And by that I mean, um, reflect on the fact that we often put code that is – let me flip that around a little bit and say that lives in the repository and gets put out of the repository with your code. So when you're running Tarball, you are killing. You're, you're killing code. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the purpose of that broken little metaphor is, is to say that when you separate code from – from the things that have to go into supporting it, it's much harder to make these alterations to it than it is to make these alterations to code. It's certainly harder to make um, alterations to it and to make it look like something that's streaming. Um, mapping modules for a real site is kind of uh, you know, a process and I'll sort of get into this in a minute, but it's kind of boring. Um, uh, is, is tough. Uh, now, Drush make helps us, or Drush and Drush make help us with some aspects of this. Uh, Drush helps us with, uh, uh, at the very least, like when you, you use Drush to pick up a, um, a um, database from Google, and then you sort of see what happens with that database. Uh, aliases uh, with the names of sites and whatever else you need help to make those aliases come in and sort of come in over time and sort of make sure that they look like that. Uh, Drush make also helps us with that sort of from the manic side of the brain and sort of the way of planning and stuff. telling you it's not super cool and clumsy because I realized that the best way to explain dog in my sort of poor attempt at, at default is just to start with where I started with dog, which is at random dog. The idea that, that, that we're going to sort of work through uh, and do in a sort of linear fashion. And the game is called Mr. Monster Hunter. And I play this game every time I'm working on a site and I'm thinking about um, how to, you know, I've got some functionality that I need to do that's sort of assumed in the site. Uh, and I go around and I try to find the module that allows me to do it. I click Control C, I go look around, I check out um, what the project label is on under that out, and if I find something, you know, I talk to the, the repo 
Father's Day this week. Uh, help me install it on Dev's site and hopefully it's easy for me to go through and figure out how to work. But at some point, I will always call it Facebook. And when I open up the module file, uh, it, it looks something like this. And basically, every file matches this. I'm canceled out. My project description is spot on for what the description is. Really trust me. Let me read this page. So I'll go, I'll go in and I value the site. Um, and this is this is an interesting time. I mean, I, I don't know if you get this every day. For me, this is an interesting time in the history of the internet for me because it's a decent chance that this is the only time I'm actually going to like do a detailed overview of what's been going on. The closest thing to the code review is that you know like I can take it back to some of the work that I used to do. Uh, I go in and I'm going to do things like token translation for structures and whatever. So, when I'm going through this, the day that I noticed something like this, this little red amber thingy, there's that, that's wrong. Um, this is an implementation that took no load. Uh, you're supposed to have both of those parameters and those things by, by, um, uh, by value with the package. Whatever. Not a big deal. Not a huge deal at all. Um, I'm probably not actually going to break anything. Uh, maybe a little bit of a red flag, but I could see the module internal is valid by, you know, applying it to the package and say, hey, you have to do this and this and that. Or we could even go with a more trivial implementation. Um, how many times have you seen this, right? I, actually, I've seen in particular implement as um, uh, a tiny PPM, right? Uh, stock speed. You know, you have typos that live on forever because they just stay in there. Right? It's actually really useful. Um, but let's, let's be a little bit more detailed about that. Uh, so, here's the problem if you're operating from, you know, um, so you've got a, a set of views that are above all other views. The problem is this. Number one, you have to get rid of the code that you already have and replace it with the code. So that's a problem. And maybe that's just going to be a SPL command. Maybe that means that you're going to have to do a project hit. Speaking of project hit and, and grabbing things and manually extracting it, but um, whatever it is, after that, you have to check and make sure the project is still there. Uh, and then if you manually create the cache files for fixes, well, then you manually make the issue and then save the cache files as JSON uh, in your tree so that anytime you want to see more than one cache file, you can just do a flash flood. Um, anytime, you, um, uh, anytime you run an update on this module, you can reapply it. That is an interesting problem as well. Because when you're updating modules, there's nothing you automatically decide to reapply to them. Especially when, you know, somebody else is coming in and, uh, and you know, um, looking at the code that I'm going to be setting up for the patches. As a general standard, like I am a general developer that works with, if you patch a module and it generates patch files and it is still standing and saving as your stuff, then that's just a very nice thing. You're not doing that for free. But even then, if you have to manually write it, Remember that it's there. If you are doing something that you actually can read directly, then maybe you have to do some scanning. So um, there's a bunch of ways that you can miss it. The most important is just not to try. Uh, so I said, well, it would be great if we could just do this uh, all in one place. And again, it's not that hard. So what does it look like if we're doing it this way? If it's, say, instead of doing this, if we carve all these clones down and pop this into the cache and make it look like this. Might be good, right? Might not be good. Uh, so, same with the for you check against the cache. Well, here you don't have to cache against the cache. You just check out the branch. You, uh, you check out the, uh, the update. Um, you go through the issue and make sure that it's still there. And, yeah, let's say that it's been the next 10 minutes. And then the latest release that you were uh, you were working from before was the 17.1 release. So, okay, so I'm still there. I'm going to create a local branch for this thing. Excuse me, and I'm going to create it from 17.1.16. Here's some text that says, add to change branch and then click this. Um, and then I'll go in and I'll make updates. So at that point, you know, we have to send the code back up to the issue, which at the moment is a patch file. Uh, we have real plans to do 
refer to the officer calling his brother over. And in this case, once we have those, instead of having to generate a hash file with the guy in the street in which you and then hook up to the phone, that seems to almost fit perfectly with what we're talking about. And you pick it up and then you can also write the redaction to it. I actually, if and when we do first year projects in my group, we will release it simultaneously with an extension to Rust that just has that one one command thing and lets you like actually make like a hash of what you're saying and then just like and you know give it the rough text of a of a of an issue the rough rough text of the issue body and then just you know put the command in there and say hey you know run this command and call the thing that I want to call. So I'm excited about that in general because that just makes Rust that makes it worthwhile to fix Rust in general. But what's maybe most interesting and what I'm excited to share with what we know right now is that when the real upstream updates are coming in, we we have a real issue that represents your change in behavior. It's not something off in some cache file that you're going to run into a few seconds later. It's as simple as running a git repo. When you git pull to get that latest code in the Kubeda.com, uh, it's going to use Git's real merge command to negotiate the issue in uh, in Git 1.01. It's going to use real Git merge command to negotiate merging the 1.1 release from upstream to downstream with the commit that you just had in the commit repo. So without having to even think about it, you can just merge that. That's your uh, that's your patch to get there. And you can decide how to be whether they've taken that patch or not. Go this out a little bit more concretely and sort of have a set of models. Um, let's say that we've got a group of trees and we say we want to have a tree, uh, and the case is that we want to have a tree of different colors. So we can bring together uh, web roots, we've got a tree of tarballs, we've got a tree of uh, the Rust and Share Rust and Thread Bell modules, we've got in the same path auto we have uh, a method that can be stored as stored as a, uh, as a file, and we can use it to do JSON conversion as well, um, and uh, use web roots to do git. Um, we've got uh, the tree for web root, and then we've got tree views and path auto all be able to get clone um, and set up the tree for the path file with path auto support for the uh, tree for the modules. I'm not so fucked up with how we can actually make this work in real life. Um, the problem that we immediately put to that issue is that that's great. We can make your latest commit on path auto, but do you have your latest commit on modules yet? Um, so what this is showing us here is uh, when you clone initially, the only like sort of availability you have is the modules that you've got. Before, you've got path auto and modules. Well, you're immediately going to need if you're if you're still building on Rust. You're going to need uh, of your own to push Git over to Rust. In Path Auto, because you've got your own TCP chains and that's that's the whole dilemma is that you're you're forced to to do that. And then you've got uh, the tree. The uh, so to immediately start to see if this isn't going to work, for example, yes, you've got multiple modes of execution, but there are problems that that come in when you start looking at, at multiple modes of execution. So, I have a question for us. What will it take to make Rust and Git Clone work like that? For the kind of obvious reason. Uh, <laughs> you basically, as a goal, you want the simplicity of this in the single repository, but the flexibility in the merge of it into multiple repositories. So that's hashing uh, and you can do merging and batching and doing those kinds of things. Um, uh, which means, generally speaking, that your what would be Git push and Git pull operations uh, can be branches and they can simply be build and then pull operations together in the same repository. That stuff has to be as simple as just push and batch. It can't be more complicated. We also need a stand down that doesn't interact with sub modules. Um, <laughs> nice. Uh, who has sub modules? Right. Um, so, sub modules are an idea, they're, they're a, a native Git core way of doing repository management. 
happen. Um, what happens is, uh, and, and the parents in Ojibwe every year is a score of references to the Odette scores that they have to get the URI and the Okongi, which are the scores that they have to review, and then the scores that pass and then set that aside for the year. So that's what happens. And um, and we play that game. And so the thing that's tough about it is that as the scores, there's an inherent tough to play is instead of showing like a branch name that's going to be a different event, it's just a name. So if it's the job one, um, that's the group that stands out. And so there's like no flexibility. Um, if, it's, if you need this other one to kind of move around it, you need to be active at all the minutes. Um, it's great if you have like a static library or if you want to kind of have an identity to it. Um, then it's great for that. That's very useful. And, and in my estimation, so modules are, are a very useful model for um, the way that most folks end up using things like this, which is run them down and then you're fairly happy to pass them at all um, if you have a system for that. And then periodically you have to change them. Um, but even then, there are weird job names with submodules or some other command uh, that the system doesn't want to sync um, on them. So any system that makes for things like getting the system to work on you um, use submodules and, and have a nice lock in situation where it's bound to have a database of some sort or a static library, but it's not used when you're not, and also make sure that the submodules are nice and stay and don't get messed up. So that's what happens. Um, another one is ensuring that the system behaves at level level two. Um, actually, I kind of addressed it in one of the videos that I did, or I shared that now I forget, but there's um, there's a ton of local configuration that goes into any given Git repository, which cannot be the same on Git, like I had some problems with that. Books, for example, that uh, are attached to different repositories, that's not going to be the same thing as the same thing that's uh, in the same place. Um, any of the names of local branches that you create, you can still create local branches that are named the same as the names of the branches that you have. And that's what this one thing is. It's one thing that the origin of some of the branches that you can create is the same as the name of the branch that you're working on. That's not required. It's not mandated at all. You can name anything you want. But if you're going to have a whole bunch of people working on your site, then you need to have all those local branches name the same, or everything else is fine. So I name things, and I name my next thing, and everything else is fine. Uh, so enforcing that is just part of the game. But, you know, if the goal here is to make working with clusters, like Git repositories, easy, nothing actually mandates that these folks, um, you know, code in Git repositories. There are all sorts of things that people are going to do to make things work. Media storage things, you need to list that thing, you need to describe that thing. Why not put other things in there that are um, part of the overall state of the Git site that you're trying to work on? And so that happens. Like, okay, we can grab the whole list and just put it in there. So, um, and at the same time, we can't forget who we work with. Because if this is actually anything, They like Git Power. Um, so how do we make all this work and um, still also <laughs> not completely stupid? Well, that's the Lucha Dog. And my friends, I will fight you. Yes, I will. That's basically the summary of, of what this entire talk is. That, that's the Lucha Dog. So let's look at how dogs actually play chess. Good dogs need houses and sleds. So, uh, um, here we're starting with a, a slightly simplified version of that same idea that, that um, Pete was talking about before. We've got two rulers and we've got two things going on. First thing we do uh, is we build them. Um, and uh, I'm sorry because I somehow, like, don't have to my data on the hand that I have here. Um, I'm not bringing a book with me. Um, but, uh, so, what is the dog root and what is the outer dog repository? That is the dog root. It is the outer repository that is going to be mapped onto the main one. Uh, there's, there's just generally a best practice anyway. Um, you should have, you, the root of your cloud repository should not be the root of, it's not the parent. There are plenty of things that live in other cloud repositories. You know, there are, there are plenty of Node systems, plenty of Linux systems, uh, whatever else, that you don't necessarily want to have as the root of your main system anyway. Um, so having some, uh, some parent is actually the best practice. 
the other thing that they need to do is is sled. Um, so the doghouse is the outer repository. Again, we have our sleds, we can make things of a little different, but the same idea. The sled contains all the information about what all the hobbies that we can have, where all those are located, the shapes that they're in, how far they can take other things, what the brand is doing, all of that, you know, answering people's emails about their local environment, all that information is basically grabbed from social media and into the sled. Um, another one that we have to add then, so if we're going to go for overall space, then of course we need its dimensions. So in this discussion here, let's say that we wanted to add that um, in another repository, right? So we're going to do that. Um, we could put it. Uh, you don't have to put it in a separate repository. You don't necessarily have to make a repository at all. Um, the idea is, though, and the reasons, though, is why not? For a couple of reasons. I mean, one is that Git can choke on very large files. It's not easy to keep them in memory, but um, very large files are less secure than other things that we are not necessarily uh, okay with the world like this. So having it in your own separate repository is just even more tough because the name is more secure. Not a good thing. Uh, but then also from the from the um, from the dog and the kennel perspective, we treat repositories as lots of things. Um, so if we can say we know we don't care where this database on the sled is located in the world, we don't care where it's stored. But from the top of from the root of that repository, we need to have it secure in some way. And the way that it uh, you know places its shared keys out or whatever. Then we can write really portable code that does things like you know keep the database on bin, keep the hint, uh, and then when it's time to load those database on it, automatically it does that. So it yeah provides a lot of the basic stuff for our Let's go back to that remote jungle map. Um, so uh, we already talked about all the different remote things that you know that would be ideal. Although just to generally note here, we now have five repositories. And three of them have got this built in, so that's fine. Um, but, oh yeah, sorry, that's sorry. The word that I use, uh, that the dog uses for these types of repositories is, in fact, clone. Origin is just this idea of a new clone. A clone must be new because they have a specific purpose. You can never, ever, ever write directly to something from a local database. That's the whole point of it. You know, maybe you can put it in the back or whatever, but the purpose of these is not writing. Conceptually, refer to that entire type of repository as a clone. Another type that we have then is called collapse. Um, and again, we don't have collapse for everything. You can follow with all the arrows and everything. We use does not have a tab. This is like from the previous discussion before. We only have the tab that's in the app. Uh, so we need the um, new repository for, for everything that we are learning. Uh, for everything, in fact, we need lots of features. We need to have uh, some brand new local repository for that. So we, the rest of the things we can come up with things. Um, two notes here. One, uh, who's terrified by the idea of having to manage like a thousand repositories or things that that kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, Gitosis will do what you do. Like, check out Gitosis. Gitosis can be configured so that the first time you push, it just creates a repository on its own. Um, so that's an immediate solution. Integration with, you know, maybe your favorite, um, uh, your favorite like Beanstalk or uh, uh, GitHub or whatever else that counts the number of repositories that you can have. This may not be the best solution for that, um, but uh, your own basic, um, your own basic GitHub system will do the trick. Uh, you're just doing a, it's also something I'll come back to when I'm talking about integration with things like Git or whatever. Um, the other note to make. Um, all right, so uh, bigger stuff, you know, a lot of stuff. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a different collab, like a different tap out of collab, say, for every different type that you want to run. It's quite possible that you might want to share those collabs amongst other repositories. Uh, you can still reshape the branches so you keep them clean, but you, with, within this type of a collab strategy, you can start building at the top your own library of modify intermediary um, uh, code uh, and easily centralize it and manage it across a whole bunch of different, a whole bunch of different sets of, uh, 
that the dog can eat. But in any case, this is our remote life, and we have to figure out a way to This is what these look like. So, passing it around. Um, roll up and roll out. I was using an antenna. So here I've like just gotten rid of all the screens. So roll it this way. Um, and then all the screens are out. The dog roll up command uh, is basically that equivalent to get switch. It says, let's take everything that's in this ball and switch, all the repositories, um, whatever needs pushing. So let's make sure that.
program. Um, so for the next uh, slide, Josh is going to talk about how to map the uh, SQL to the Java file. Um, and uh, I'm going to start with uh, um, Canary going to SQL and then allow the Java file to be mapped to the SQL file. Thank you. 